Well, hey, everybody, welcome back to the Everyone Wins podcast. It's really great to have you join us again. Uh, excited to have another episode. And as we continue to think about what it looks like to be just leaders, and today I have just some great friends who I admire deeply in the way that they are leading their companies. For us to talk about what it looks like to be leaders who invest in our people and create environments for them to thrive at work. And I think all of us feel like we have a long way to go with that. We don't feel like we're experts. And I know Tyler and Jeff who are on the call today will come to this call feeling like maybe they have some things that they can grow in related to this, like we all do. But the reason why I've invited them to come is because I just really appreciate the way they have modeled this for me, even as they are uh, learning as leaders and the ways that they have built their companies and assumed their positions of leadership to have the kind of influence that they're having and the people that they get to lead. So I'm excited that you guys get to hear from them today. So let me introduce Tyler Graybill, who's the CEO and founder of Southern Outdoor Restoration, SOR, which is a commercial pressure washing company here in the Triangle. And Jeff Brove, who is one of the partners at Thomas, Judy & Tucker, which is a CPA firm here in Raleigh that does just a, uh, works with a variety of organizations in uh, and around North Carolina. Um, so guys, thanks for being here. Yeah. Good morning, David. Thanks for having us. Thanks, David. Excited to have this time together. Yeah. So <clears throat> Tyler is, um, at the headquarters of SOR, which is having some construction today. So we might hear some background noise, uh, as the company is growing and refitting their office space, which is awesome. Jeff is working from home today, which is great. So um, I want you guys to hear from them in terms of their leadership stories. And I'll start with you, Tyler. Um, talk about just your story of your company, SOR, and how you have gotten to the point where you are today. There's a lot you could say. I mean, I've given you some prompts, like who are some people who really influenced you along the way? What were some of the things you had to overcome? But go ahead and just dive in. Love to hear your story. Yeah, sure. So um, I grew up in Cary back when Cary was a gas station and a horse farm. Um, and um, I started pressure washing at the end of high school. Uh, throughout college in the summers to make money. And I um, ended up getting more work than I knew what to do with the first summer and hired some friends from high school to uh, help me power wash. And I swore off of it every summer uh, saying like, all right, one of these days I'm going to get a real job or a real internship because uh, all my friends from college were getting internships in New York and Dallas and Boston with, you know, Deloitte and BCG and Morgan Stanley and uh, Blackstone and, uh, and I was just power washing um, and ended up taking a job in finance out of school in 2010, did that for 12 months, had no idea really the context of the time in, you know, kind of post financial crisis. Uh, but it was a grindy job and I uh, said, I'm going to take my suit off and put my boots back on and start pressure washing. And at the time, I just wanted to have a little business and making money, knowing what I doing, what I knew how to make money with, which was just pressure washing. And um, one of the most pivotal points in the SOR story actually happened two months in. I fell off of a roof or had a ladder slide out from under me and broke my arm. And I had to hire, I was forced to hire my first employee. That was, so I started in April or uh, let's see, February, 2012. And in April, 2012, I'm in a sling and had my first employee. And so um, ever since then, just to fast forward, you know, a decade, uh, but 
we saw a big opportunity to inject professionalism and technology and a genuine authentic care of people into an industry mm -hmm. that hadn't uh, really seen that before and had really lacked in those categories before. Uh, and the community and the market has really affirmed us in that uh, over the last 10 years. So where's your company now? How many employees after that first one that you hired? I hired five yesterday, David. No. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you hired five? Uh, two account managers and our first ever female technician yesterday. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, Caitlin. Fabulous. Um, so... Uh, yeah, we are, we're about 70 total headcount, maybe more than that now, low seventies. Wow. Um, we are an exterior cleaning contractor. We do pressure washing, gutter cleaning, window cleaning. We are based in Raleigh. We have two locations. We did an acquisition last year, uh, and picked up a warehouse in South Raleigh. Uh, we service the Southeast, but the vast majority of our work is within about a uh, 40 mile radius of Raleigh. Wow. Before you're having trouble finding people with mm -hmm. the shortage of labor, do you feel like that's changed in the last year or so? We've been really fortunate from uh, the perspective of retaining people. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of people in our industry have experienced a lot of turnover uh, and the, uh, the labor market was not insulated from, you know, the, the great recession or excuse me, um, resignation. Um, but we've been really fortunate uh, to keep a really high uh, retention rate. Essentially, if you come to SOR and stay longer than six months, you stay for years. And there's a lot of people that just have never left. Hmm. Yeah, I want to come back to that because that really is at the focus of what we want to talk about, which is what it, yeah, what does it look like for people to just love their work so that they stay and how that impacts ultimately the bottom line, but also, also just the ongoing culture of having people feel like they're valued. They have a great opportunity for a career and feel like they're a part of a family, um, even in an industry like yours. Jeff, how about you? What would you say, how would you describe your leadership journey? I know you have a variety of experience, um, even before you got to Thomas G and Tucker. Um, so describe that for us. Yeah, I would, say that certainly has been a, a linear path for sure. And if I were to go back to, to college and you know, ask myself the question, would I be in the, the seat that I'm in today? I don't think I knew I, I would be in some type of position of leadership, but probably didn't look quite uh, like, like it does today. I always, when I was in college, I, I always thought that was something a little strange with me because they say that most people change their majors, you know, two or three times. And I uh, knew I wanted to major in business and accounting and I, I never changed. Um, so that was, uh, you know, just for me, as I got into it, I, I found that I really enjoy my work. I enjoy uh, what I do. And my you know, leadership journey, I think has really been about people who have poured themselves in, in, into, into me. And I, for, for me, having those people, especially early in my career, who kind of came alongside me and uh, gave me opportunities and uh, really just, you know, cared for me well, not only just as a professional, but also just personally. Mm -hmm. And at the, as I have grown and, and become a, a leader myself, I think for me, that's been a real drive of, of wanting to do that uh, for others, because that was really what was modeled to me. I go ahead. So I'll just kind of give a little bit of my journey, how I, I got to. Yeah. Where I am. Go. So mm -hmm. I, I went to University of North Carolina for undergrad and grad school, and I spent the first 10 years of my career with EY, one of the national firms, and that was a great, great experience. And then I was at a career transition. I just didn't really know. I was just working too much. 
um, and really didn't know what was what was next for me. And my wife and I ended up spending what we thought was going to be a year in South Africa working as missionaries in an orphanage, uh, turned into be almost three. And uh, Chris Judy's one of our founding partners. He and I uh, knew each other through church and had some conversations about uh, potentially joining TJT. And so when we were uh, originally, I, I was actually going to join after spending a year away. Uh, but then I told Chris, that, you know, we just didn't know how long it was going to be before we returned because the orphanage was in such a crisis. And we just said, okay, God, you know, when it's time to go back, just, just make that clear. So about six months before I knew we were coming back, I reached out. And uh, it just worked out that there was a spot for me. And uh, it's really just been an incredible journey of, of to see our, our firm grow and you know, uh, also opportunities for our people. Yeah. Jeff, when you talk about people who really influenced you, are there spe- is there a specific person you would identify who really impacted your leadership and what impact specifically did they have on you? Let's say two people. Uh, one, my my father was a real encourager of whatever I was doing, whether it was playing sports or in my schoolwork or um, being a dad. He he was always a person who really encouraged me. But he was also in his own uh, career was a real entrepreneur and he took uh, a lot of risks and he had a lot of failures for sure. But uh, it was also fun to see there was some dreams that, that he had that came to fruition that started as something that was a brain in his brain. And that was just neat to see. Um, So I think that's, that person, the influence in my life who uh, was a real encourager to me, uh, definitely shaped me. And then in my my first job, um, Bob Thorburn was someone who I, I worked for, and he just was a person who uh, really, you know, cared for my development as a person in, in a professional stance, but also I think me personally as well, and just really cared about me. And I went through some some tough times and he was always there for me. And that really shaped my, uh, I think me as a, as a leader. Mm-hmm. Wow. That's great. How about you, Tyler? Were there specific people or person in particular who you'd say really influenced you and your leadership and what specifically was it that you would say was the impact? Yeah. When, when I saw that prompt, David, I wrote down a handful of names and I think like the, uh, the cliche answer would be to, you know, provide a couple of mentors and advisors. Uh, and I have those and they've been wonderful. Um, specifically, uh, Mike Hendren, Michael Crafton and Van Isley. Um, and, uh, but when I was really thinking about it, I think one of the most influential people that have kind of shaped my leadership has honestly been my wife because we met, uh, we met, five weeks before I quit my job and started SOR. And so she saw it from like literally the very beginning. The first time I met her parents was like the day that I broke my arm. So I drove myself to the urgent care, uh, you know, get the x-ray, get the castling, whatever, and like drove to dinner. And I was like in pain. And they saw that, but they were like, you know, hey, this this dude must really enjoy our daughter. He like, you know, he could, he could have easily gotten out to dinner tonight. Um, but Laura's been like a really wonderful encourager, and if and if I had to say like why she's been so impactful, it's because she's been so understanding of the uh, the lack of structure that comes with early stage entrepreneurship. Because her dad is a um, was a professor and administrator at NC State and led their entrepreneurship initiative program, and so she got exposed to a lot of entrepreneurship and like some of the late night um, 
meetings and weekends that he had with his students. Uh, and a, a really funny story, but Red Hat was essentially founded in their uh, on their kitchen table. Wow. Um, yeah. And uh, so Laura's been just a really great encourager uh, throughout this whole thing. That's awesome. Like this past weekend, uh, we had a job show up at the Wake County trash transfer facility and uh -huh. I had to go out there and she was like totally fine with it. It's Sunday. It's between church and Jack's baseball practice. And I came home smelling like the trash transfer facility. She was like totally fine with it. <laughs> Probably because it's you probably didn't smell quite that much different than normal, right? Right, Tyler? She gotten used to it. I mean, yeah, it's super fishy. Yeah. <laughs> so, Tyler, did you envision you being in the place where you are today with a company that you have, 70 employees, doing pressure washing all over the Southeast? Did you envision that? Yes. And what what drove that vision for you? Like when you, when you say, you know, I'm, I'm where I thought I would be, or you may not even, you may have greater aspirations of where you, you even want to be, but what drove that? Uh, entrepreneurship has really been an outlet for my creativity and building a company is like not dissimilar to like cooking taking ingredients and figuring out how they're all going to work together and making sure that they're prepped properly and cooked properly and uh, they all comes out together. So it's just been a really great outlet for creativity for me. I love mm. system design and uh, designing org charts and how roles and people flow together. How about you, Jeff? You mentioned earlier, you, you may not have seen, like you said, if I look back and thought I was going to be in the position I'm in now, I probably wouldn't have thought I would be in this position. Do you feel the same way? Or do you feel differently? Yeah, I wouldn't have been able to envision this specifically. However, I didn't know that I had gifts of leadership and I knew I would be using those in some way, but just the way this has played out for me in, in my career um, has really just, you know, come from opportunities through, through relationships and yeah. you know, people who I've known, you know, I often think about, wow, what would have happened if I hadn't met that person? You know, uh, if I had never ended up at, Church of the Apostles, where I, I met Chris Judy, and, and how my wife and I ended up there was a story in itself that um, he makes you wonder, uh, gosh, what what would have happened or which direction of uh, my life have, have gone? And so I'm just really thankful for for that and and those relationships, and just certainly see God's hand and and all that work of how those people who I came to know that then allow me to be in the positions of leadership that I'm in today. And our firm has four offices, all in North Carolina and 180 people. And it was started 32 years ago. I, I was obviously not one of the founders. And so that's also really humbling to kind of come in and, and be a part of something that you didn't start, that to have a position of, of leadership in an organization that certainly wasn't your baby. But the, I think the founders of our firm all had sort of a perpetual mindset of every decision that we make. We want to make decisions that are going to be building an organization that that's going to be lasting beyond the the current generation. Mm -hmm. If you were to go back to when you first started, Jeff, what advice would you give to yourself now, that, based on what you know now in your in your role? Certainly the things that you think are important or a really big deal are oftentimes really not that big of a deal. And so things that we look at that may worry about or um, think are really super important. And this is really was the most important as my experience has been as time goes on and you look back, you're, you know, I would say to myself, oh, that 
this thing that I was worried about or, or focused on that really wasn't the most important thing or it really wasn't a big deal at all. And I was thinking it was a big deal and it turned out not, not to be. Hmm. How about you, Tyler? What advice would you give your young self? I'm still young. <laughs> I think that advice would be somewhere in the vein of, uh, don't spend time on things that aren't going to be part of the eventual vision. There was, there were some things that we did, maybe jobs that we took on or projects that we did that made some margin in the short term, but it was never going to be part of, uh, the long-term vision of SOR. Uh, and maybe we took on a, a good example of that might be like some carpentry jobs that we took on. Like we were never carpenters. We never had any desire to do that. And what ended up happening was I worked part time for my day job and had and put a bunch of focus on the side hustle. And all it did was kind of like cost me time. It just deferred out achieving some of the long term vision stuff. Mm -hmm. So have there been some main lessons then that you've learned that you would say if you were to pick the top two or three lessons that you've learned over the time, Tyler, uh, what would they be? Um, I think one of the lessons is to uh, not glance off bad news when you have to deliver it to somebody. Uh, just don't feel like you need to put a bow on it or package it up or sell it. Um, sometimes it's just okay to acknowledge the fact that it's bad news and it's crappy and, and it is, and you just kind of like, um, sit in that with the person that you have to deal with it. Um, mm. and I think I, in early on in my career, I felt obligated to kind of package up some of that messaging or, uh, you know, sell it as like, it's going to, yes, this is bad, but here's the good spin on it. And I've just kind of over the years learned to just take away the spin. Nobody wants to spin. Tell it like it is. Yeah. Jeff, main lesson or two. Uh, certainly that managing people is more of an art than, a science mm. you know, each, each person is just so different and how they are created and the way you manage one person isn't necessarily going to work for how you manage another person or, or work with another person mm. certainly one uh, another one being there is certainly no formula so you may make a decision one way in one sort of circumstances and then five years later or or just in a different situation and you know, try to make that same decision using the same sort of thought process. And that may not be the, the way to get the best outcome. Mm. And then the third being similar to what Tyler said, it's so important to be direct. And I think my experience is where I've had to give someone direct, honest feedback. And it's really been most rewarding particularly when someone who is underperforming and to be able to give them that feedback and then see that change happen and to see that person really appreciate that that feedback was given to them and then be able to focus on making that change that needs to happen and to watch that person grow is uh, really been fruitful. I would, I would imagine that both you guys got to the point where you realized that you needed to figure out how to invest in your people. And there was a switch that turned on where, and a lot of the leaders that I'm working with have a point where they, they, they hire people to help them get the job done. And then they realize that instead of focusing on getting that job done or washing the building or getting that tax return done, they instead, their, their role really was to lead people and to invest in them. Where, when did you have that aha moment? What, what was, what turned that on for you? And, 
And how did you have to begin to change in your leadership so that you would, you were focused on investing in the people that you were, you were called to lead? Tyler, how would you answer that? Golly, there was no like lightning strike uh, moment for me with that. Uh, and if I'm being totally honest, like I'm still trying to learn that truth now. Um, but I get glimpses of uh, of affirmation that that saying is, or that yeah, that that concept is true. Uh, but it's been a really challenging uh, just thing for me to transition from being an individual producer to a coach and a leader. But there's been like like I said, there's been little little glimpses of affirmation there, like. Uh, Yesterday, uh, two of those folks that extended offers, I didn't extend those offers. All I did was the initial phone screen and the team ran the whole process and they brought everybody in and they got feedback on who they wanted, who they liked and who would fit. And uh, I literally, I never touched an offer uh, and I've never done that before. And I was like, huh? Oh. <laughs> there could be more of that. So, yeah. So how did you, yeah. So how did you feel? I was like, I could fish more if I did more. This <laughs> how do you, uh, and Jeff, I want you to answer that question too, but J Tyler, how do you, how do you, um, I guess, coach yourself with all of that when you've, you're kind of vacillating between this idea of being that producer versus letting go and letting your team take on more responsibility and getting satisfaction out of that? Yeah, I coach myself by just reminding that my wingspan is never going to get bigger. I always wanted to be six feet in life, and I was always five eleven and a half. My wingspan is is you know six feet. It will literally never get bigger, which means I can only get my arms around uh, so big of a tree. But if I want a really big tree, I'm just going to have to accept the fact that my arms aren't going to fit around it. Jeff, how about you? Was there a moment where you realized it was it was uh, your your purpose to invest in people? Is that some, you know for me as I know you, it's something that I think is natural for you. But do you feel like it's natural for you to think that way? Yeah, I think it's it's natural for me. Um, for me, I think as I thought back on that question of you know. Was there a point in time that I realized that investing in people was important? And my, the first thing that came to mind was earlier on in my career, I was working on this project. There was a team of three or four of us working on it. And we were you know, really just pushing ourselves hard to get this project done. And, you know, finally someone said, what, what are we doing? You know, and um, as we began talking about it, someone said, you know, the person who was the really the leader of the project, this person really cares for us. And this person has poured into us. And because of that, we're pretty much going to do anything this person wants us to do. I mean, from a, you know, um, as it comes to serving our serving our clients and, and working on projects together. And I, I think the biggest reason for that is we, we just felt empowered as individuals to, um, you know, to, ha to shape the project and to make decisions. And in, through being, because we felt in, empowered, I just think that's a, that's a powerful feeling when someone has put their trust in you. And it really, at least for me, really made me operate out of a place of, of gratitude that I was just so thankful for to have the opportunity that I did in that, um, you know, someone had invested in me like that. And certainly mm -hmm. as I grew my career, I had kind of came from the place of, gosh, I, I want to invest in people like, like that, uh, because certainly it influenced me, those who invested in my, in my career, my development. Right. 
Yeah. So for you, for you, Jeff, do you have specific intentional things that you do on a daily or maybe weekly basis that you would say are specific ways that you are making sure that people feel empowered that you lead? Yeah. You know, one thing that was said to me once is that once I kind of moved into a more of a manager type role, you know, I was told that we're not paying you to do work or paying you to lead. And that really was uh, stuck with me of, hey, as I make decisions that I really need to think about, how am I impacting other people and what am I doing to uh, allow those people, you know, opportunities to, to make decisions and also to fail. I often say that, we hire really smart people and um, people, people want to be challenged. They don't want to just be stuck in something that isn't challenging them. And so I think by, you know, decisions that I make or think about, Hey, what, what are ways uh, opportunities that I can allow someone to run with a, a project that um, they may fail at it, but they're certainly going to, but if that happens, there's going to be some learning that happens in that process. And then I think the other thing is just taking time to personally check in with people on how they're doing, or if I know they're going through something or if they had something they're doing with their spouse or with their family to, to check in with them on, Hey, how, how was that experience for you guys? Or, or what, what's the update with this situation? And trying to just know them better personally and what's going on in their lives. Cause I think that then just creates, creates connection and allows, um, people just to feel like they're really more, um, they're, they're part of the team. Yeah. Well, what if they can't do the work as well as you can, Jeff? Mm, that's a, uh... That's, that's often a, a, particularly I think as a early manager, I really struggle with that because I would know that I could get it done faster. And, but I think as time has gone by, I think I've, I've realized that, yeah, I may be able to get it done faster, but really to build a successful organization, if you want to grow, you can't do everything yourself. You've got to have other people um, who are doing the work. And so by, you know, making those intentional steps of saying, well, I, yes, I could do this myself, but if I allow someone else to do it, you know, it's sort of like the you know, concept of teaching a man how to, how to fish. And if you got there and get all the fish yourself, you're, there's only so much production that you can have. But if you teach someone how to fish, then they certainly are, that's going to be a, a skill that they're going to have that. They can be self-sufficient, but also if you have multiple people who have learned that same, same concept, then there you're going to have multiple people all doing the same thing at once. That's going to be um, yeah. helping the organization grow. And it seems obvious, right? Uh, but it's so hard to do. <laughs> like you said earlier, Jeff, people are hard to lead. Everybody is specific to their personality and, it's an art, not a science. So it takes a lot. And it's hard to feel like you had a productive day when you didn't get to check things off your list. You were just leading people all day. What's a productive day look like? How about you, Tyler? What specific ways that you would say in a given week, you're being intentional to invest in the people that you're leading? Yeah. I just want to pause and give Jeff some encouragement as a, uh, uh, friend that's known Jeff for uh, a number of years now. Uh, Jeff is, uh, Jeff's a great leader. And one of the reasons is um, because of his sense of calm. I mean, so there's a phrase uh, that panic is contagious and calm is contagious. Uh, and Jeff, I just want to share some encouragement with you this morning. Like you are the most like contagiously calm person I've ever met. And I'm very appreciative of that. Thank you, Tyler. Because sometimes I say, uh, as it relates to our kids, oh, they're going to be fine. And 
one day, uh, Aaron said to me, that's always your response. They're always <laughs> going to be fine. So sometimes it, it can, uh, can come back to, to, to bite you, but well, I'm appreciative about that. Tyler, are you, are you on the panic side of that phrase? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think though, like the, some of the intentional ways, uh, that I like to use are, um, explaining the interconnectedness of jobs and roles in the context of our company, and also explaining the interconnectedness of our business with, uh, just the market and the clients and our vendors as a whole. Uh, I, yeah, I really like just kind of coaching uh, our team on the, um, the economics yeah. of like the world we live in. Yeah. Well, that's so important. I'm gl- so glad you said that. You're giving context, right, for why everyone's doing what they're doing, which for leaders, we can often think that everybody understands the con- context because we see it. And yet people don't see things from our eyes, don't have the perspective we have don't have the history we have with the company oftentimes. And so they don't have the broader perspective of why they do what they do, which is so vital for them to feeling like they're value valuable and having impact in the work that they're doing. Have you seen how that's impacted your, your team? How, how have they operated differently because of that? Would you say? Me, David. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, um, to steal a phrase from Shay, who you brought into our group not long ago, um, some people have sight but no vision, and uh, and I think it's our responsibility as a leader to give people vision. And how it's manifested just in the context of SOR is um, there's a, a culture of shout out that's been created over the last number of years. And so uh, we have we have connected the growth to the good work on job sites and given credit to the guys in the field who are doing that great work and connecting for them. Hey, because we won this project, we won this next one. Right. Yeah. Good. Well, we have just a few minutes left. I want to end our time talking through how you guys have wrestled through what it looks like to be a just leader. Uh, We've been talking about that in our just leadership groups, which you guys have been a part of. And both of you come with a deep interest and desire to think about these ideas of what it looks like to engage issues of justice, how to be just, what does that even look like? How does that impact our culture? What does that mean for our employees? What does it even look like to be a just company? So it's a huge topic, but I'm curious just to know why that's something that's important to each of you and why you're thinking about it. Jeff, why don't you go, why why is this something that you think is, is really important for you as a leader and for you guys as a company? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. And one of the reasons I think it's important to be a just leader is a, it's just right. It's the right thing to do, but you know, none of this stuff here on earth is, is ours. And you know, the people who uh, people who've been called into positions of leadership, it's really our our job <clears throat> to make sure that we are spending time to build companies that that are just companies. There there are companies that are going to think about um, other people and what are ways and what are things that we can do to influence influence those other people and create opportunities for people and, and i think in one of the just leadership conversations that we were having and early on and there was a, a picture of, of what it looks like 
for the whole city to rejoice. And I think David, you shared some images of, of, of pictures of, of what it looked like of an entire city rejoicing. And I think that just gave a real good picture for this is what it could look like if you were to build a company um, that was built on just leadership, because if you do that, everybody is going to, everyone is going to share in the, the success of the company and the whole city is going to be rejoicing because of it. How about you tell her? Yeah, man. A uh, lot of thoughts to cram into a few minutes, but um, I think when when engaging with this topic, I'm just reminded that uh, God is a creator and a developer. Uh, that creation started with a garden and ended with a city, um, and um, and I think when Jeff talks about like the city rejoicing. Uh, that context is uh, is rejoicing that people are free of oppression, like that kind of rejoicing. Um, and so when I think about the business, um, I really want to grow uh, the company because I think that the uh, I really genuinely believe that the community and that we work in currently in the communities that we're working in the future will be better off because we're an employer there. Uh, like I have a deep conviction about that. And so I want to make those investments in order to make those investments. Uh, I need to be profitable. Uh, and when I think about profitability, you have to really be careful uh, about how you do that with a sense of justice. Um, I tell our team that profitability measures the efficiency of value creation. Um, and I really want to be as efficient as possible in the work that we do at SOR, but I don't want it to come uh, at the expense or the, uh, to use a harsh word, oppression of anybody downstream or upstream. As an example, uh, if, I, if I pinch a vendor on pricing and they're smaller than me, I have used power and influence uh, to potentially like kind of curb their margin and maybe in a way that they don't have the ability to afford benefits for their employees. And, um, and so I have, I've, I've probably taken profitability a little too far in that regard, but there's efficiencies or inefficiencies that can be stripped out. And when they do that, that unlocks a bunch of uh, profitability and capital that I can use to, invest in growing and um, pouring gas on what we're doing here. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. So that gives your example there gives just a real picture of what sort of extra expertise, wisdom, leadership is required when we're thinking about what it looks like to be just, because there's other factors that we have to take into consideration that a lot of people just may not pay attention to or don't care about. Jeff, are there ways that you guys have, you know, this has impacted you as a leader and how you lead your people to think about what it looks like to be just or things you that's things that have been required of you that you've had to engage in in order to, to pursue this? I think for me, yes, especially being part of a company where you've got 13 partners and so, you know, for me, it's been mindset of how are we going to get all of our partners kind of pulling the same, you know, pulling the same line as it relates to being a, a, a company that um, is, is building just leaders. Um, but then also just for all of our leaders within our organization, you know, how are, how do they know? that this is something that's important to us. And so we're just sort of starting the, the process of developing uh, core values for our company. And the value is already there, but just sort of going through that process is going to allow us to put words to what is already happening. 
And I think that just gives some clarity to all the people inside and outside of the organization of this is this is what we stand for. And this is uh, what's important. And it's also going to allow us to you know, use those core values as a, a lens through which all decisions are made, um, not just yeah. for our current uh, leadership team, but for for leadership teams in the in the future. Right. You, you want this baked into the whole culture, right? Not something separate. That's right. Well, guys, well, that opens up cans of worms. We could continue talking, but our time is up. Uh, just to really thank you for your leadership and the models that you guys are uh, presenting to many, to the, those that you're leading and to others, peers around you where you're, you're stewarding what, what God has given you and the positions that you have for God's peace and justice and doing it in a very intentional way, also in a very humble way, sometimes calm, and sometimes panicking <laughs> as we're all on this journey of leadership, knowing that we, we all have room to grow, but they're just incredible ways that you guys are being used to invest in your people and it shows because of the success of your businesses and the kinds of uh, culture and, and sense of family and belonging that people feel at your businesses. So thanks so much for your time. Really appreciate it, Tyler and Jeff. Yeah, thanks, David.